must get through. Mail from home. Nourishment for the soul. For men who are working for peace, half away from their hometown, a nourished soul is not enough. We must have ships on the line and crews to man them. But more than this, we must move food and equipment to these ships and men at their distant ocean addresses. These men need fresh vegetables and meat. On an aircraft carrier, 10 tons of groceries every day. Their ships need fuel oil. Their aircraft need replacement parts. And their guns need ammunition. Today, with our Navy engaged in a hot war thousands of miles from our shores, the oil pipeline and the track for the supply train must be stretched to new dimensions. The battle today is in Southeast Asia. Tomorrow, we hope there will be no battle tomorrow. The Navy's job is to take the strength of America wherever it's needed. Not always to fight, thank God. Usually to promote peace by making new friends and working side by side with allies. An aircraft carrier task force, by only being in the North Atlantic or the Mediterranean or the Taiwan Straits, is a kind of insurance against battle. No supermarket down the street, no gas station around the corner. It's a long way to the shopping center from here. Wherever on the world's oceans our ships must be, the gas station, the department store, the hardware, and the grocery must go with them. For the supply fleet in the Gulf of Tonkin, this is a large order. The rendezvous address has been agreed on, an unmarked crossroads among the waves. Let's come right to course, 320, speed 10 knots. Uh, sir. Right, standard runner. Right, standard runner. Right, Steady on, 320. Steady on, 
keeping the task force on the job starts at Sioux City, Amarillo, and San Bernardino, and at all the cities and towns across the nation where the products of an abundant economy are grown or manufactured or taken from the earth. Join the Navy and, well, Pacific Fleet sailors do get around. Many seaside bases serve as warehouses for the fleet. Okinawa, Guam, Subic Bay. For the war in Vietnam, Subic Bay in the Philippines is the shopping center. Only two days steaming time from the Gulf of Tonkin. Every time you turn around here, there's another ship from the States to be unloaded. Or a ship riding high back from Vietnam, ready to be loaded out again. Yankee Station, here they come. The idea of taking supplies to ships at sea and handing them across the water was new to the Navy at the turn of the century. Sailing ships had been able to stay where the action was for weeks or months. Sea breezes provided the power. Sailors' diets were less complex. And round shot was more easily stocked than bombs and missiles. Then came the day of the steamship with its huge appetite for coal. Large men of war burned 50 tons of coal a day, and to keep their bunkers full, had to return to port every 10 days or so to recoal. The Navy learned a lesson in 1898 during the Spanish American War. The Spanish fleet was blockaded in the harbor at Santiago, Cuba. When the Spaniards made a run for the open sea, three of our ships, including the old battleship Massachusetts, were 45 miles away being recoaled at Guantanamo. The need for on-station at-sea refueling was obvious. Early efforts to solve the problem led to the development of a high line for carrying bags of coal from a collier to a warship, one in the wake of the other. 
World War I saw the beginning of the Navy's conversion to oil burning ships, and soon the colliers were out of business. All right, when this whip, which is on a sending ship, is heaved around on, it will pick the load up in the air high enough to clear the bulwark. Go ahead and pick it up. It took the pressure of the Second World War on the Pacific, a war that reached into the far corners of that ocean, to make underway replenishment a regular feature of naval operations. Americans, with their ingenuity for things mechanical, worked out several ways to do the job. Now let's go back to this third rig, which is called the house call rig. It is rigged much the same as the Burton rig, the first rig we talked about. The whip is heaved around on, heaved around your whip, which will lift your load clear of the deck. Your outhaul is heaved around on, which will start your load outboard. Bring it across. Your in-haul is slacked off, which will give your load to Cantonary again. One whip slacked off, the other one heaved around. When you get to the other ship, or the receiving ship, you'll be right over the elevator or any other landing platform you have. Both whips have to be slacked off. All right, does anybody have any questions on this rig? Uh, approximately how far apart are these ships and uh, what would happen if there were uh, power casualties? Usually the ships steam not more than uh, 200 feet apart. If a power casualty happens, and it's something that will affect the rudder or the steering of some type, if the power casualty causes a swerve on either one ship or the other that's real drastic, you'll probably part all the rigs before you can initiate an emergency breakaway. The war in the Pacific made new demands on the Navy. We had the fighting ships and men, but our new mobility meant that the supply lines had to be extended quickly in order to project our power across the oceans and keep it there. This is Commodore Leon Grabowski, replenishment group commander in the South China Sea. Back in World War II and in Korea, the combatant forces would retire from the scene of operations to conduct their uh, resupply. In the Vietnam operation, the supply comes to the combatants. They remain on station. Carrier, he may be engaged in their operation. Regardless of what he's doing, he needs his supplies, whether it be fuel or ammunition, delivered right in the course of the operation. The hazards to the service force ship are just as great as they are to the other ship. USS Constellation, 4,000 hard-working crewmen pass through her chow lines three times every day. Today's unrep, I want you people to remember, under no circumstances, I want any skylarking on this station. If anything goes wrong, let me know about it. Remember, we'll be working the hatches at the same time, so we'll be swinging loads. Keep out between the load, the bulwark, and the open hatch. This is extra important. Keep your feet out of the bottom of the line. You got your phone line, your messenger, your bridle. Make sure you keep your feet out of them. Any questions? How many loads are we going to send over there? We have approximately 17 loads to send over. Two winch operators. You'll change the rig during the shift. The rest of you men, get your lines ready, down, and fake all set for running. Anything else? All right, men, here she comes. Let's go. Stand by for shot line. Four and a half. For every trip from the United States, the USS Vega comes loaded with hundreds of foods to keep those chow lines moving. 25 tons of bacon, almost 2 million eggs, more than 130,000 steaks, enough to keep the Constellation crew fed for more than six months.
This is automation. Electronic inventory controlled by computer. What makes this control room unusual is that it operates on a ship at sea, the USS Mars. The Navy calls it a combat store ship, but it's more like a supermarket. A thorough shopper could find refrigerated food, dry foods, all kinds of supplies, and a warehouse full of spare parts for almost anything the Navy uses in this part of the world. This is Captain H. Riley, Jr., commanding officer of the Mars. Mars handles ships alongside, both sides, uh, as do other replenishment ships. But Mars also has the H-46 Sea Knight helicopter. And this instrument allows Mars to replenish an entire task group at the same time. Normally, the heavy will be alongside on the port side, receiving the normal underway replenishment. And at the same time, these two helicopters, carrying loads in excess of uh, one and a half to two tons, rapidly can replenish the entire screen, for instance, a carrier task force. Destroyers not having to come off station to come alongside at all. smoother and better and make our drops quicker. Sometimes a long day of this flying can be rather tiring because of the concentration involved. The hook on the UH-46 is about 20, 25 feet behind the pilot's seat, which is a long way back for you to be aware exactly where that hook is at all times. When you come in over a deck for a pickup, you line up the spot in front of you and pass over it. From then on, the crewman, who is laying in the back by the hook, looking down through the hatch, directs you right or left. You also have a uh, signal director on the deck, usually, who is giving you uh, signs, too. You tell the crewman, we're going in for a pickup. He says, Roger, I have the deck in sight. And then he says, easy forward and down. And you come in, and then he'll say, easy right, uh, easy down, we have a hookup. Up, up, easy right, up, easy back, uh, mark, which means the weight's coming on, and then loads clear, you're cleared to go. Helicopters can pass the bacon or the ammunition when the seas are too rough for a high line. The Navy is finding that it has developed its supply techniques so well that it must now look for ways to help ships stow the huge amounts of supplies they receive. Like the housewife who can buy almost everything she needs at a modern supermarket, a ship on the line can make one visit to the Mars and come away with enough food and supplies to last three weeks.
When the tempo of operations demands round-the-clock schedules, supply ships play a variation on their theme, night replenishment. You put a 3,500 pound load under a helicopter. You pick it up at night and you, you fly out off the ship and you get over the black water between your ship and another ship and you can't see anything. And you look at your gauges and everything, of course, is pitching because the, the ship swings when you put that load under you. And it, the load will be spinning or going back and forth. And you get the weirdest sensations. It's akin to vertigo, I'd say. And I'd say that's some of the hairiest flying that I've ever had to do is flying at night with a heavy load under me. That part of it is more excitement than I care for. The Navy has come a long way since the days of Mr. Roberts and the USS Reluctant. The newest trick in the service force bag of ships is one which will carry the beans, the bullets, and the black oil. Here at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, the third ship of a new type is readied for her launching day. Nearly twice the size of her older cousins, she will carry more fuel than any oiler and more ammunition than most ammunition ships, and groceries and clothing, office supplies and hardware too. But until there are enough of these seagoing shopping centers, most Navy ships will continue to pay regular visits to the oilers, ammunition ships, and provision ships. Many of these ships have been in service since World War II, the unsung ladies of the Pacific Fleet. For want of a nail, wrote Ben Franklin, the war was lost. The job of Service Group 3 in the Western Pacific is to make sure that the Navy's war in Vietnam is not lost for the want of even a case of ammunition. As the Navy adds nuclear ships to its fleet, it will slowly outgrow its thirst for black oil. But carrier jets will still need jet fuel, and jets have big appetites. If automobile gasoline were being pumped through this hose, 
one minute's worth would take your car from New York to San Francisco ten times. Navy men will never outgrow their need for fresh vegetables and meat and mail from home. Wherever in the world they stand their duty, the fleet that can deliver anything, anywhere, will find them. In the far west Pacific, the sun is just breaking over the China Sea. Another day is beginning in Southeast Asia as the warm, humid night slowly turns into a hot, humid day. If it were a different time and a different day, this quiet early morning countryside would be a thing of beauty. But it is today. Another day of war in Vietnam. And to think I could have had the swing shift this week. So what's better, sleeping during a stinking hot night and working during a stinking hot day or vice versa? Answer, a cold shower. At the air bases, the long night's work is all but finished. Tired men look to others to take up their labors. War, like any other human effort, is carried out on a day-to-day -day basis. In Vietnam, the days are long and the effort is great. Throughout the Republic of South Vietnam, at odd-sounding places like Da Nang, Quinh Yon, Pleiku, Nha Trang, Benoit and Tom Sanut, another day of war, another day of work begins. In the early light on the line, ordnance men and maintenance men prepare aircraft for their first missions of the day. I've never in my life worked as hard as I have since I came over here. Everybody works at least 12 hours a day. There's a lot to do on airplanes that are used as much as ours are. They have to be in top condition when they go out, or they may never come back. So we take a lot of pains to keep them in good shape. A lot of pains. They say genius is an infinite capacity for taking pains. I guess that makes geniuses out of us guys on the flight line. Others in remote areas are also preparing for the day's work ahead. Forward air controllers inspect the little planes they call bird dogs before taking off to seek out the evasive Viet Cong. Vietnamese airborne troops double check their equipment as combat support units ready the transport aircraft that will drop them into Viet Cong territory. Every man is not a hero and every man does not fly. 
In war, there is a time to destroy and a time to build, all in the turn of a day. Building can be seen every day, everywhere in South Vietnam. Bases grow rapidly under difficult tropical conditions and the eye of a crafty foe. Some of the buildings we put up aren't going to give Conrad Hilton any competition. That's for sure. But they serve their purpose. We put up a lot of them and we put them up fast. Some of them are made out of plastic. We blow them up like giant balloons. You like being part of this whole thing because you know you're doing something worthwhile. I don't only mean for the troops that are going to use these facilities, although that's certainly important. But there's something else. You get the feeling you're helping build something more permanent. Something that'll be here a long time after we're gone and this mess is settled. Modern air bases number few. But tiny airstrips flourish and provide landing areas for delivery of supplies to remote areas. Cargo airlifts are the vital link between supply centers and men fighting in the wilderness. You call, we haul is our motto. And we're sure glad to be able to deliver the goods to the guys out here in the boondocks. Not too long ago, those little men in the black pajamas were running up and down the hinterlands, killing and maiming and stealing, with hardly anyone around to stop them. Now there aren't quite as many of them, and they aren't quite as cocky. Our guys and the tough Vietnamese forces we're supporting are seeing as that. Fighting out in the sticks like they do means we have to bring them everything they need. Anywhere they are, any way we can. Vietnam, perhaps more so than ever before, it is also fought in the minds of men. The weapons are words and ideas. You hear a lot about the power that ideas have, good ones or bad ones. It doesn't matter which. You can see the calm idea at work and the atrocities they commit and the fierce way they fight. I suppose they believe just like we do in what they think they're fighting for. They just don't happen to know what they're really fighting for or against. So we try to let them know with our leaflets and broadcasts. Besides philosophy, they have lots of concrete reasons for coming over to our side, like food, medical care, reunion with their families, and a good price for their weapons. While we're giving them the word, we also provide them with safe conduct passes that will let them return and establish their allegiance to the government of Vietnam. Last I heard, some 30,000 had come over. These people bring a lot of valuable information with them. After a little retraining, most of them become useful citizens again. Even in war, there is a time to comfort and care for the innocent and the stricken. Air Force doctors in remote areas devote considerable portions of their skimpy spare time to healing the sick and wounded who are not in uniform. We see a lot of the same type of problems over here that we'd see any place else. There's a lot of pneumonia, malaria, worms, running ears, and tuberculosis. These long-suffering people are extremely grateful for anything we do for them. We often treat entire families with a variety of problems. A large number suffer from anemia and the effects of malnutrition. Iron tablets and vitamin pills usually put them back into pretty good shape again. Some of the conditions we run across, most of us wouldn't see in a lifetime of practice in the States. Many of these people have had serious diseases like leprosy for years and have never received any medical attention whatsoever. The ravages of disease 
fought in Vietnamese villages. The ravages of tyranny fought from the skies over Vietnam. An Air Force combat control team drops into a Viet Cong infiltrated area to set the stage for a Vietnamese airborne division that will follow. The drop zone is marked as a target for the Vietnamese paratroopers. The control team maintains radio contact with the aircraft until it is in position for the drop. On the ground, the airborne troops await the paradrop of bulk supplies as they prepare to enter the enemy-dominated marsh country to hunt the hunter. Meanwhile, fighter aircraft are poised to swoop down and rake Viet Cong troop concentrations, munitions dumps, and supply areas. The targets are hidden behind a mantle of dense vegetation. The forward air controller makes his search for the seemingly invisible enemy. Spotting his quarry, he marks the area for fighter aircraft to follow through. cutting edge of air power slashes into the thickets of Viet Cong strength. Farther north, vapor trails mark the paths of bombers that continue the daily bombardment of enemy installations, bridges, and underground tunnel complexes. destroyed. Sometimes airmen must abandon their damaged aircraft and descend into hostile country. Often within minutes, air rescue helicopters are at the scene searching the area. Once the pilot fires his smoke flare, we've got to move in fast because the VC know where he is, just like we do. We go in so low to drop the cable that a well-aimed pistol shot could probably down the helicopter. But there's a pilot down there and probably hundreds of VC closing in on him. So the order of the day is don't drag it. Most of these pilots we fish out of the woods are really something. The first thing they do, of course, is tell us how much they appreciate our being there. And in the next breath, they're usually talking about getting back to flying again. In war, there are many harsh reminders that freedom is not without its price. Every day, misfortune mingles unannounced among our fighting men. Hearts are often heavy as silent warriors who have given their final day are borne back to their native land. Each day in Vietnam, young Americans put forth a determined effort to stem the unpredictable tide of tyranny. The greater the effort of each day, 
the greater the total effort, which leads to final victory or defeat. As this day begins to ebb into twilight, night warriors take up their tasks once again. For them, there will be no sleep during the passage of time that brings tomorrow and another day of war in Vietnam. to say exactly what goes into making a marine or a man for that matter but whatever it is there are two basic elements you always have to have one is good material and the other is the right environment if the marine corps has come to be known for the caliber of men it turns out it's largely because of the value the Corps places on both of these requirements. It may not look like it, but the Corps is very careful in selecting its recruits. And when it comes to training them, well, you can judge for yourself. For all Marine recruits, processing begins right here. You're now Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego, California. You're about to start your first day of processing. There are five days involved in processing. These five days do not count as part of your training. From now on, the first word out of your mouth is going to be, sir, unless you are asked a simple question that can be answered with a yes or a no, and then you will answer yes, sir, or no, sir. While you are here, we'll expect you to act as a man. You will be treated as a man. From now on, you will do things to the best of your ability, and you will move as fast as possible. Almost as much a trademark of the Marines as the way they carry themselves and walk is their distinctive hairstyle. It takes some time for recruits to develop the other characteristics, but they can get the haircut in just a few minutes, which is just one of the many practical advantages of this kind of haircut. The haircutting begins the processing, and in a way, it's rather fitting because it graphically marks the kind of radical transformation the recruits can expect in other areas. As the processing continues, the recruits get the initial issue of clothing they'll wear during training. The first scrub down in the core is the first of countless showers and wash-ups of all kinds they'll undergo in the Marines. The Corps has always been zealous about cleanliness and upholding the military tradition of neatness and bearing, no matter what you're wearing. Go down and exchange trousers 34, 36. The Corps is also very demanding about physical condition, and so examinations are an important part of the initial processing. All of these men were carefully examined before they were accepted as Marine recruits, but the Corps just wants to be sure there's nothing wrong with them now. Those that need glasses will get them. Number seven is missing. Number 14, snake eyes, 
If any bad teeth are found, they'll be taken care of while the recruit undergoes training. Is that 30 occlusal? Yes, number 30 occlusal. Okay, Father. I'll be here in the classroom all the rest of the morning to give you assistance on any uh, question that you may have. Yes, sir. The Corps also wants to know just what its recruits are capable of. And so they're given a series of tests. Those with some special skills will get more tests. The PT, or physical training tests, are designed to be equally revealing about the physical condition of the recruits. require it will get extra training and attention to ensure they meet the requirements set for all recruits. The last day of processing, the recruits receive their rifles and other tools of their trade, which they'll learn to use during training. 59, 27. Uh, bro, I just... I just... Oh! What do you do, sir? Put down your gear. Aye, sir! Processing ends with the arrival of the drill instructors, or DIs, who will lead them through training. For the recruits, this is probably the most important event of the processing. It brings them together with the men who are going to be personally responsible for their training. During the training, the recruits in each platoon will spend some 16 hours each day under the sharp, watchful eyes of their drill instructor. Over the years, these drill instructors have become almost as much of a legend in the Corps as its heroes. And rightly so, because they've had a hand in shaping most of them. But like all legends, they've been transformed and exaggerated into something that they aren't. And as a result, they're frequently judged on the basis of what people have heard they are, rather than what the recruits actually know they are. Whenever you're told to do something, do it, do it, and as quickly as possible, to the best of your ability. All three of us, the commander and the two drill instructors, will be in charge of it at all times. In any case, it's hard to exaggerate the importance of the D.I.s, and the Corps is very much aware of the role they play in making Marines. For this reason, it carefully selects them. officer in your chain of command. Yes, sir, I was. Let's see, have you passed the PFT in the last six months? Yes, sir. Do you feel that you have anything medically wrong with you that would disqualify you for this type of duty? No, sir. Steps on Green, you realize that this is a very challenging job and a very demanding job. It'll probably mean that you'll have to spend approximately eight hours a week at work and probably have to be away from home every third night standing the duty. Do you want to be a drill instructor? Yes, sir. I would like to be a DI. Then Justice carefully trains them at its drill instructor school. Spirit of instruction, we're going to be covering the daily seven exercise. You as drill instructors must know the Daily 7 exercise in order to teach your recruits. The Daily 7 exercise is nothing more than a warm-up exercise. Thank you. Welcome aboard, sir. Thank you, sir. Please take a seat. Just got a drill instructor. When they do become drill instructors, they work under the supervision of a series commander who is responsible for all the platoons in a particular series. Thus, whatever he may be, every DI is carefully selected, carefully trained, experienced, and under constant supervision. 
While you're in the lock, Sergeant Cruz, we're just uh, picking the series up on receiving, and uh, we'll be able to get with them all the way through, and I think it'll be a very rewarding experience. Uh, it's much better starting with them. So uh, I'll be seeing you on the drill. Give me a buzz, I'm right. Huh? Huh? And if he seems brusque and impatient, it's because he has a tough job and not much time to do it. Recruit training actually begins with the DI taking over and telling their platoons exactly what will be expected of them. The first place they run up against these demands is on the drill field. They get more of the same in physical training, where they begin with the basic exercises. And it continues in their classes. This part here located in gray in color is known as I'm going to move down here and pick up this part right here, which is under this break. Some 10,000 troops under the command of Brigadier General Ross. The Marines over here on the other side with only 500 men careful not to touch the inside portion. And we're going to place the dresses directly on the wound. We're going to spread our fingers out. Our... There are also practical applications, such as guard duty. Sir, Frag Iago reports post number four, hold secure. Post and orders remain the same, nothing unusual to report, sir. Report your post. Sir, Frag Gonzalo, post number five. Training in close combat. Everybody's constantly tired and aching these first days of training. Still, the exercises get progressively harder. But they keep at it, and for most of them it pays off. For some, however, it's too much. As soon as the DIs spot individuals who are having trouble, they usually work out a program of their own to give them special help. However, when a private's inability to progress hinders progress of the platoon and other recruits, he is assigned to the special training branch. Now that's just a small part of the contract that each and every one of you people signed when you come into Marine Corps. Now that's part of the reason why you're here in motivation here, the recruits work and live with others who have the same problems, and special programs are set up to help them meet the training requirements. Some may require additional motivation. Others need help in physical conditioning. Two, sir. One, sir. Two, sir. One, sir. Two, sir. Some have medical problems which keep them from participating in the activities of a normal training platoon. For those who find it difficult to obey the rules, there's correctional custody. By the time the final days of the first phase of training roll around, Everyone is beginning to feel that they're a part of a team. By now, the soreness and stiffness have begun to disappear. So have 
confusion and uncertainty. Fire driver, report him back to sick man's order, right, sir. I right, get your gear off and go with the rest of the series. All right, sir. <laughs> Most recruits manage to find the strength and energy for sports and for competition with the other recruits in training. vital part of recruit training. With every man required to swim at least 75 meters, fully clothed, and carrying a rifle. By the time they've completed the first phase of training, the recruits are considered ready to be introduced to another old tradition of military life. Mess and maintenance duty. Recruits have a week of mess and maintenance during their training. They spend the next two weeks at the rifle range. First, learning how to use their rifles. Weapon into your shoulder, rotate enough, keeping the right elbow up high, straight up. Bring the elbow well underneath the piece, aiming in, getting a good natural point of aim, squeezing the trigger straight to the rear. Then, practicing to develop skill. opportunities the recruits will have to qualify with their rifle. All Marines are required to fire for score once a year. Also included in second phase is an introduction to combat training. Here, the recruits are trained in basic skills they'll need in the field. Go up to 360 degrees. They learn how to use a compass. composed of that makes up the earth. Now then, what we're going to learn today is how to shoot an azimuth. Before we can do this, we must practice using maps. Such as the point, if you look to your rear, where the radar, little radar, is set up on the hill. Here, they have a chance to actually work with mines and demolition charges. The recruits also learn to use grenades properly. Prepare to throw. Throw grenade. On the way! Filtration training.
combat training introduces the recruits to the kind of food and living conditions they'll encounter in the field. Practically all training is in the form of exercise, with the recruits actually doing what they're learning. training activities take place at night. Tracer displays show the various kinds of coverage produced by different fire patterns. The men return to the recruit depot for the third and final phase of their training. This is a spit and polish period, and everyone is very much aware that there are only a few weeks of training left. With the recruits expectantly looking forward to the end of their arduous and demanding schedule, and the drill instructor struggling to smooth out the rough edges in time for graduation. In the meantime, Everyone continues to drill. The physical training is harder than ever. Still, everybody does it. Their schedule is tougher than ever, but now they can handle it without straining. For those who display a potential as leaders, there is a special program to develop it and make them aware of the challenges and rewards as well as the responsibilities of leadership. Almost before anybody can believe it, graduation day arrives. As far as the recruits are concerned, there are really no special preparations. Their barracks are always spotless. The ranks and uniforms display the same daily meticulous care. What family and friends of the recruits see here today is no special show, but actually the same conditions they could see any day. The big difference, of course, is in the recruits themselves. For parents and relatives, it's well worth the long trip many of them have made to be here. It's a proud and happy day for families and friends. The recruits' pride and feeling of accomplishment seems to be contagious. Even the seasoned old mentors who have gone through this many times before feel it. And some of those tough, stone-faced characters will even sheepishly admit that they feel a great sense of loss every time graduation day comes around. It's an especially proud day for the recruits who receive awards. And there are many, ranging from the most outstanding recruit to those who have excelled in the different areas of training. But whether or not they received a special award, all the recruits have a feeling of achievement. They've earned the right to be called Marines. It takes good men to get through the Marine recruit training program, and everybody knows it. Two facts you can't get away from. It's that the Corps obviously started with some pretty good men. And it's equally obvious that it did a pretty good job of training. The whole thing is nicely summed up in the words of one mother who wrote, We sent you a boy, and you sent back a man. She could also have said, 
you sent back a Marine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 